Well, good morning, South Union, and welcome back to each and every one of you and to all of our online listeners. Welcome. Today's scripture text is taken from the book of Job, chapter 3, verses 20 through 26. Why is light given to one in misery, and a life to the bitter in soul, who long for death, but it does not come, and dig for it more than for hidden treasures, who rejoice exceedingly, and are glad when they find the grave? Why is light given to one who cannot see the way, whom God has fenced in? For my sighing comes like bread, and my groanings are poured out like water. Truly the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. Let us bow our heads in a word of prayer. Our Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the power of your Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace. Father, we thank you so very much for who you are, and we remember that you are good that you are our Creator. Thank you for loving us, Father. Thank you for your majesty. Thank you for being so good and kind and also severe. Lord Jesus, thank you so very much for who you are. And Jesus, we thank you that you have come to earth, that you died for our sins on the cross, and that you rose again to grant eternal life to all those who believe. Thank you. Now, Father in Jesus, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, and we pray that your Spirit might enliven us and quicken us on the inside, quicken our hearts, and open us to the message that you have for us. Open the message that you have for us today, Father. Teach us something new. Instruct us. Lead us. Affirm us. Encourage us. Rebuke us. Challenge us. Whatever you might have for us, Father, please come and bless us in your Holy Spirit. And Lord Jesus, I pray that your presence might be here with me as well, that this meditation might be pleasing in your sight. In your name do we pray. Amen. Today we are beginning a two-part sermon series on grief. Today what we're going to be talking about is grief, grief itself, a little bit about the process, a little bit about what we might be experiencing um, or that we could experience in the midst of grief, specifically from the standpoint of Job. And next week what we'll be doing is taking some biblical approaches for handling grief in a healthy way. Now, it's really important that we look into Scripture deeply and understand that Scripture uh, is the Word of God, amen, but it also gives us deeply human experiences, real life experiences that match what me and you may be going through at any given point in time. And grief is most certainly one of those elements and it is it is certainly an element that we all will experience in life whether it's something small or whether it's something large uh, through varying degrees of intensity depending on our personality and how we handle grief and work through it um, but uh, we will all experience grief now, in case you're wondering where grief is in the Bible, you know, grief actually is present at the very beginning. So God created humankind in seven days or formed um, humankind out of the dust of the earth, according to Genesis 2, breathes life into them. Eve is in the world and everything is joyful and happy. And then humans, Adam and Eve, sinned by eating the forbidden fruit. And you can just imagine that God was grieved in that sinning, but also Adam and Eve are grieved as they lose paradise and are exiled out of Eden into the world. That is definitely a form of grief that they experience right there in the beginning of the Bible, in the beginning of human experience. Not only that, but Adam and Eve then have some of the deepest grief I think parents can experience. They lose a child, Abel. And even worse, they lose their child to a murderer who happens to be their other son, Cain. 
we can just imagine the deep grief and horror, the sorrow over this tremendous loss. And not only do they lose Abel, but then also Cain gets exiled from their presence. They lose two sons because of one son's murderous actions. Later on, Noah experiences grief as he watches all those whom he relates to in his surrounding community die in the midst of the flood. Soon after that, Lot loses his wife. She turns into a pillar of, pillar of salt in the Sodom and Gomorrah incident. Joseph, uh, one of Jacob's sons, loses one life only to find a new life in Egypt. And yet you can imagine he had deep grief and anger for many, many years in Egypt while being thrown into prison or treated as a slave and then thrown into prison and remaining forgotten in the prison for many years. Dinah, so little mentioned, the daughter of Jacob, is raped and then never given voice after that in the scripture. Jacob himself thinks he loses a son only to regain him years later in Egypt. And he loses his favored son, Joseph, after losing his favored wife, Rachel, to death during childbirth. And that's just in the book of Genesis. And that are, that, those are just griefs that you can skim through Genesis and find. I'm sure that there are many more. The Psalms literally have a category for grief psalms. They're called lamentory psalms or psalms of lamentation, right? There is a book called Lamentations talking all about the grief of the prophet Jeremiah over the loss of Jerusalem. And then finally, we also have the book of Job, of course. The book of Job is primarily a book about grief. And of course, it struggles and, and enters into these different questions about evil and suffering and God's involvement and where is God and all of this and who and what is righteous and righteousness. Job experiences grief. Jesus himself intimately knew grief. In fact, in some, some places, in some books, you will hear him called the man of sorrows as a referent to Jesus. Many scholars theorize that Jesus loses his father, uh, Joseph, either in his teens or in his early 20s, which is why he's r never really mentioned in the Gospels outside of an abstract conversation. Then he bears the grief and the weight of all sin upon the cross and even experiences separation from God for a moment. A grief is a substantial part of not just the human experience, but also of our scriptures that we read and hold dear. And it's a good thing that the Bible isn't silent about grief, because sometimes we can get some funny ideas in our head about grief. We can maybe move in one of two different directions. Sometimes we think that uh, we shouldn't grieve for whatever the reason being. We, we think we should be stoic in nature instead, um, thinking that for whatever reason, if we grieve, we're somehow lamenting God's will or not believing in God as our good shepherd or something weird along those lines can happen. Or we think, well, God caused this, so if it's his will, I don't need to grieve. Or we think, well, my loved one is in having such a reward and is such in a better place, therefore I don't need to grieve. No, those, those are faulty, weird ways of thinking, friends. And the second is that we may think instead that we need to be in constant grief. We take passages like, Blessed are those who mourn, for there they will be comforted. And we take that to mean that we oh, that, that's a virtue to live into, that we should always be in grief about something, which, by the way, is literally impossible to sustain, um, much less practice, much less live into. Uh, so next week, we're going to helpfully hopefully 
tackle that one verse, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted in its context, in its way of helping us to understand how we can go about properly grieving. However, grief is not meant to be something that is everlasting. Grief must also have an end point if it's going to be healthy grieving. So what can grief look like? Well, there are just some things that we've picked up and we've learned along the way about grief. And I want to mention them very, very um, quickly before we move into our scripture passage on Job. First, um, there's uh, something really kind of set in our American culture about grieving, and it comes from the five stages of grief. And usually this is uh, stage, it used to be stages that we moved through almost like stepping stones. Now there's this idea that it's kind of like almost cyclical, but it's kind of a, a messy, chaotic, cyclical sort of thing where you can bounce to and from these different stages in any particular manner, depending on how we grieve. But here are some very common experiences that we have when grieving. So first, um, we can experience denial and isolation anger, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance. Now here's something important to realize about grief. Grief is an emotion or a thought process that we can feel or enter into over any sort of loss in our lives. It could be um, a loss of well-being through suffering or harm or being hurt. It could be the loss of a loved one. Um, it could be the loss of an item or a profession or a way of life. Any loss of any nature can cause grief. And indeed, Terry Wardle at Ashland Theological Seminary would even say, Every grief, no matter what it is, every grief deserves an appropriate season of grieving. One more time, every loss deserves an appropriate season of grieving. What does that mean? That means, uh, you know, if we stub our toe, we may grieve for 30 seconds. If we lose a loved one of five years, well, we may grieve for five months. If we lose a loved one for 50 years, we may need to grieve for five years before we um, uh, are, are through the stages of grief. Perhaps, because each person is different. Now, there's also a different way of thinking about grieving, and this tries to encapsulate also more experiences about grief, and they're called trajectories of grieving. And these trajectories of grief are kind of thought in these sorts of manners. There's five I'm going to mention um, from an article by Maxwell and Perrin um, called The Problem of God in the Presence of Grief. And they name five, such as resilience meaning that we're relatively unaffected by whatever loss we've experienced. The grief really isn't touching us. There could be relief, meaning a nearly an immediate sense of resolution over the issue. And I know I've encountered this one personally. It also can um, be accompanied by feelings of guilt and, and even shame. But really, this sort of relief is like we know that a loved one is going to die and it's been a really hard year or two years or six months and then when they finally die we've been expecting it and we still kind of grieve but then we also feel this huge sense of relief because now those caretaking responsibilities are over and then since we felt relief we also are awash with guilt and shame because we should be grieving the loss of a loved one or of a friend that's a trajectory of grief Third, there's recovery, meaning return to a pre-loss emotional self, meaning that the grief takes place and they're able to return to um, whatever situation they were before in their emotional life. Um, fourth is recurrence, meaning that there's a trajectory of chronic grieving happening. And finally, there's a reprieve, which means that um, there's a pause between the event and our felt grief. And sometimes that can happen, especially with all of the stuff that happens when someone passes away or dies. Uh, you know, the funeral home and the funeral and the graveside and the meal and the family and the talking and the friends and the church and all of this sort of stuff happens. And, and then you have to resolve the estate and all of this happens. And then afterwards, 
the grief hits. That's a possible trajectory. It means there's a reprieve, a delayed grief slash trauma. Now, Maxwell and Perrin also um, list three others that they find in Job, and I'm, I'm presuming that there are many other trajectories as well. They say there's um, resistance to the loss, meaning desiring answers for the circumstances we are in. And you could just hear this in the mouths of some Christians, why God? And we shouldn't make light of that, because we need to be very, very tender with some of the circumstances that people are in, like losing a child, or, or having a chronic illness that will lead to their death, and they're only 40 years old, or 30 years old, or somebody, um, uh, you know, loses a spouse, or, or a child, many of those sorts of situations, someone gets kidnapped, or they lose a leg, or an arm, or a limb, or their sight, whatever might happen that causes grief, and the resistance comes in as we ask for those answers. Why, God? Why did this happen? There's a second one called um, re recompense. Um, it means uh, looking for something back from God. And really, in the sense of grieving, it means demanding God to act on our behalf. God, write this wrong. Um, there's that sense, and that's a, that's a part of grief that we can experience in, in some of the different situations that we may be facing. And finally, there's also um, a sense of a re-evaluation, meaning we re-evaluate our circumstances in light of the grief that we've experienced and the loss that we've experienced, but perhaps also in light of new information. So, for example, in Job, at the end of the book of Job, not just Job, but his three friends all reevaluate the circumstance based on what God tells them. And yet even then they don't figure out or know, it's not revealed to them, the full truth of why Job is going through what he's going through. And so we, we also too can experience that we can begin to reevaluate circumstances. Now one possible trajectory of grief is found here then in the book of Job verse 20 and on, uh, Job chapter 3, verse 20 and on, and that's where we're going to be hanging out for just a little bit. Let me reread Job chapter 3, verses 20 through 23 for us. Why is light given to one in misery, and life to the bitter in soul, who long for death, but it does not come, and dig for it more than for hidden treasures, who rejoice exceedingly, and are glad when they find the grave? You know, this is a picture of someone who is longing for death to overcome them. Really, because of their circumstances, because of the grief, because of the loss, Job is in this position of, it would be better if I had not been born. It would be better if I died. In fact, I'm like a, a man hunting for my lost lottery, win, lost winning lottery ticket, right? Uh, the, the man who's searching out riches because of his exceeding grief and he's just he's going to celebrate when he dies folks that that's a picture of a man grieving in deep sorrow over his circumstances that's a man in great depression and part of the the issue here is that the the, the depression has no place to go his anger at his circumstances has no place to go in Job's theology, God is good. He is right. And even when he calls God into question, it's not God's character he calls into question. And so his anger has, has little place to go, and it's trapped on the inside, and it's caused him to be depressed over his circumstances. Now, here's the thing, just in case we don't think this can happen to us. Job is a picture of a man who is righteous. He is a man who is nearly flawless, right? Here's Jesus in righteousness, and here's Job. Job is number two on the list. He is a picture of a, someone who is godly. He, has, he is blessed. He has everything going for him. And in that sort of man who is good, good, like 
core good, who, who knows God, when that sort of man experiences this sort of suffering, he goes into a depression. And that can very well happen to us too. It's not wrong. It is not beyond the scope of Christian experience. It is not something that is abnormal. It's something that can happen to us. And just to remind us of now, the, there is something else important here that we need to talk about, which is the circumstances that Job is in. Job was wealthy. He had everything. He had 10 children, seven sons, and three daughters. They have livestock, a house, and everything. And when his suffering comes, when his trial comes, when Satan puts him on trial to really test his character. And by the way, if you read carefully in um, Job 1, it's about testing Job's character. But Satan has also put God's holiness and character to the task. Right? Um, and that's really part of this equation is that uh, Satan is actually challenging and even um, demeaning God's character. And God says, I'm not going to have that. My character will not be demeaned. Go ahead and test my servant. Right? And we need to priority list here is number one is always hallowed be thy name. Right? That's the list of priorities. Our Father who is in heaven. Hallowed be your name. When you utter that prayer, when you pray the Lord's Prayer, that is what you're saying. You're saying, Father, beyond all else, whatever the cost, may your name be praised. After that, take care of my needs. And please do that. Right? And we realize that's what we're saying. And Job is going through this very experience. God's name is being impugned. And therefore, Job is tested in order to hallow God's name and make it holy. Okay, and that's the trial that's a task. Now, during this trial, it's awful. Job loses ten children. He loses his profession, their means of living, i.e. all of their livestock. They lose their house. It crumbles to the ground. Job then loses his body in significant ways. He becomes um, covered in sores from head to toe. And he sits in his ashes of his house with a, a piece of a pot, right? A pot shirt. And, and scratches these sores with this, with this piece of a pot, right? And you just imagine this is suffering. Then we might say, well, no, Matt, no wonder he's depressed. No wonder he's grieving. And then we say something like this. Sometimes this is what people say about grief. Well, therefore, I shouldn't grieve because I'm not as bad off as Job. Or I shouldn't grieve because I'm not as bad off as so-and-so or the people in Africa or all the people who are dying in hospice or ho hospitals or whatever the case might be. Folks, here's the thing that we need to start doing. And this is a lesson about grief. Do not compare your loss or your circumstances to another person's loss or circumstances. Your loss needs to be grieved no matter how bad off someone else may be. They need to do their own grieving. Hallelujah and amen. That does not mean that you do not need to grieve. We must grieve. Don't compare circumstances. Now back to our text. So we understand the circumstances. We understand he is depressed. He is without hope. Look at this in verse 23. There's something important here to find. Why is light given to one who cannot see the way whom God has fenced in? Now here the indication the light means um, really the light of the eyes. It's, it's a matter of being able to see. Why is somebody able to see when the way is not seeable? Right, and he's, he's, so he's playing on those sorts of terms in this verse. And when we talk about the way here, what we're talking about is the manner and the course of life. We're talking about not just how we do things, 
but what is being done. And not only what is being done and, and the, the manner in which they're done or the character in which we have, but we're also talking in a profound way about dreams and hopes and aspirations. And significantly, we're talking about purpose. We're talking about a loss of purpose. Why is light given to one who cannot see the way ahead? My purpose in life, right? Job's purpose was was to to he was tending the flocks and managing a huge household, taking care of his children, right? He would especially in a religious manner. He continually took care of them. He consecrated them and sacrificed for them. And he had a large household to manor. Um, he was probably tending to grandchildren too. With the story doesn't go there, but uh, there might have even be grandchildren involved. Who knows? But he has a distinct purpose in his life. And that purpose is torn from him. All the wealth, all the livestock, all the profession, all the children, torn from him. How can we go on that's what Job would be saying. Now, I also want to translate this into a different way. And I have a series of questions written down that I think are pretty good. We could reframe the question that Job is asking about purpose and about the way to something like this. What in the world do I do now that my profession is gone? For many during COVID-19, that's a very serious question. What do we do now that my profession is gone? Who am I? without this profession? How do we make men meet? What what does a day-to-day look like? What do I do now that my loved one is gone? How can life go on? What is to come in the future? What do I now do with all the dreams and the goals that I had with someone else, right? With a spouse or with a loved one that have now died along with this loved one's passing. We always, on the bucket list, wanted to hike up the mountains and rest in a cabin. What do you do with that now that your spouse is dead? And you don't want to do the thing anymore because the whole point was to do it with them. What do we do? How do I manage life? For others, it might be, what do I do now that my body is torn away from me? That I've lost my my legs, or the cancer is taking over, or my eyesight is lost, and I can no longer see, and I can no longer read, and I can no longer sew, can't even watch TV because I can't see. What can I do now that my hands are shaking so badly? I can't do what I used to do. What happens when my way seems to be fenced in by God himself so that I cannot pass along the path I was proceeding down? Right, and that's the image there. There's a way, there's a path. Imagine a road and suddenly a huge fence drops down in front of us. And the direction we're going is gone and we're looking to the left and looking to the right and there's no way to sneak around the fence. We've now got to go way out of the line. We've got to go way off the course we were on. Or even backwards to find a different path. What do we do? Those are the questions of purpose in the midst of grief that Job is asking us about. And it's questions that might rip out of our own souls too. For each of these questions may also demand a response in our season of grief. There's something about uh, Katie and I that is little known because Katie and I have remained mostly silent on it, Um, but with her permission I can now share this story. Um, When Katie and I were first married, within the first month of our marriage we actually became pregnant. And um, when we found out, it was around the five or six week mark of the pregnancy, and we found out, and we were both rejoicing, but also scared. Uh, we'd only been married five or six weeks, and now we're going to be having a, uh, uh, we found out that we're, we're pregnant five to six weeks into the marriage, and um, 
uh, we're just we just didn't know what to do and um, so we we sat about in in my very task oriented goal oriented way of doing things we made a budget we figured out the budget we did the furniture planning right so that we can move the furniture for all the new furniture that we would need for the baby we did our jobs and how we would arrange our scheduling of those jobs we did the book purchasing for research right I've told you about that before uh, I always like to research things so we bought the baby books in order to research uh, we started to look at clothing and the prices and the whole thing we started to navigate but then most of all and most importantly for us were the dreams the dreams that we had for this young little child uh, the names we had we had picked we were able to pick out two we were so excited we picked out two names one for a boy full name first and middle we picked out one for, for, for was a girl, first and middle name. And um, we, we would spend time um, imagining what this child would be like. And there were, there were dreams with this child. I then went off to a week-long denominational conference. And the very day I got back, we had a miscarriage and the grief for me and how I experience grief it just hits like a tidal wave and it ripped out of me from my toes all the way out my eyes and my mouth and I cried and I cried and I cried and I mourned because it was the loss of a beginning of something new it was the loss of a child. It was the loss of dreams. It was the very sh sudden shutting down of plans. It's like we were fenced in by God. The vision out in front of us was suddenly inaccessible. The, I mean, life just looked so different the whole undoing of everything of all those plans just after we had begun to readjust everything was a trauma and some may say that my grief was overdoing it but that would actually be to minimize the grief. Others may say, well, that's how things are sometimes. Now you have two beautiful children. Amen and hallelujah. We do. We have two beautiful children. And yet the, they do not replace the one whom was lost. They don't. That loss is still there. Some may say, well, we had such and such happen to us. Yes, I'm, I'm sure that many had similar experiences. And you can empathize. And yes, those losses also deserve to be grieved. And doesn't mean just because there's a common situation that that common situation shouldn't be grieved. Others know even more acute defined loss, loss of loss of children whom they've known and seen sometimes for many many years before losing them all sorts of different losses and with those losses can come can come may come a loss of purpose a loss of vision a shutting down of the way we were going Now, there's also a way that grief can sometimes seem unending. In verse 24, Job says this, For my sighing comes like my bread, and my groanings are poured out like water. Um, this is actually a little bit of a mistranslation. I'm not sure why it's mistranslated, um, but it should say, For my sighing comes before 
my bread. And my groanings are poured out like water. And and the reason here is, is just to say, before he takes in bread, if he was taking any bread in, his sighings would come out. Many times, for some of us in the population, the first thing we want to do in the morning is get something to eat. It's called breakfast, and I'm a huge fan of coffee and breakfast. I, I really enjoy food, so the first thing I'm thinking about when I'm getting up is getting food um, and uh, also time with God as well. And, and those two things are on, on my plate at the same time. And for, for Job here, he's saying, before I do that, my sighings and grief are already coming out of me. Some may even say that it's a loss of appetite represented here, which is also a, a way, a form of grieving. And, and that loss of appetite indicates, again, that lack of, that loss of purpose. It's that sense that I'm not quite sure I want to do those normal things that give me pleasure and sustenance in life. One more time, it's the loss, or it's the, it's the sense of, I'm not quite sure I want to do the normal, pleasurable things that give me life, like eating bread. It just, it suddenly tastes like ash. It, it doesn't have meaning anymore because of the loss and the grief that we are experiencing. Not only that, he continues on. Truly the thing that I fear comes upon me, and what I dread befalls me. Now here, I just want to say that um, there's no place really in Job where we're, we're mentioning fears a lot, or anxiety, but there is something that we can pick out from chapter 1, and it's the fear of undergoing God's wrath because of something his children have done. Specifically, undergoing God's wrath because of what his own children have done, with them undergoing wrath. And so we see in Job chapter 1 verse 5, it says, And when the feast days had run their course, meaning the feasting of his sons and his daughters, when the feast days had run their co co course, Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt sacrifices according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This is what Job always did. What is he doing? He's making repentance for them. He's, he's trying to make sure that they are covered, that they're clean, that no harm will come to his children. Which is something I think all parents can relate with. And he says, The thing I dread has come about. And we too may also feel and think like that. That the thing that we are most anxious about has come about and, and, and Job, I mean, is holding God responsible for these events. And God doesn't actually um, uh, doesn't actually let go of that responsibility. He does not deny responsibility for anything in this book. Um, however, we also specifically know from reading Job, Job 1 that Satan is ultimately responsible for everything that happened to Job. Why? He's the one who is demeaning God's holy name. We say, well then God, was God has in his permissive will allowed Satan to do that? No, God was holding priorities as they should be held. His name first, second, his creatures. Um, our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. This is this is a, a normal way of grieving. So, is it part of his permissive will? Well, it, it wouldn't have been permitted in any other circumstance, except something beyond the veil was taking place that was greater than Job. Okay, now that's for Job's situation. There are many situations on this planet, in this earth, the loss of children, uh, loss of a loved one, the loss of a body part, the loss of a profession, COVID-19, all these things which uh, are happening, which we don't know what is going on in the heavenly realms with this. And so we come to the place of trust in him, and we'll talk about that next week. But here's the ending point for Job and his grief. 
Verse 26. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, but trouble comes. We might almost say, yes, Job, that sounds like an understatement for your situation and for the grief you're undergoing. But it also might be what we're experiencing in a powerful way. So what do we do with this grief, right? Well, we've said that grief shouldn't be unending. So now where do we go from here? What do we do with it? Unfortunately, we're out of time for today, but next week we're gonna be looking at biblical ways of helping us through grief and helping us to remain in God's counsel and in trusting God, even in the hardest times. Let's pray. Our Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the power of your Holy Spirit, we come before your throne of grace. Father, we just thank you so much for who you are. Now, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would come and bless each and every listener. Help us all, Father God, to know you more. Holy Spirit, please come. In your name do we pray. Oh, Father, we ask that you would touch each person who is grieving or in a season of grief in this or who's watching this video that you would reach out and touch them and touch their hearts and console them that you would heal them that you would help them to know just how trustworthy you are how good you are and that they as your little lamb will be taken care of. Father, come. In your name do we pray. Amen. Thank you so much. Let me send you out with a blessing from the book of Numbers, chapter 6, verse 24 and on. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and truly give you his peace. Let us go in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.